Right, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, just um, a few things at the top, and then happy to take your questions. This morning, Secretary Austin departed for London to attend the AUKUS Defense Ministerial Meeting. The AUKUS DMM is the third of its kind, marking three years of enhanced security partnership and provides an opportunity for Secretary Austin to meet with his UK and Australian counterparts to review progress and outline steps for continued work under Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of AUKUS. We'll have more to share in the coming days, but under Pillar 1, you can imagine or you can expect the Secretary to reaffirm the United States' commitment to supporting Australia's acquisition of a conventionally armed nuclear powered submarine capability. Under Pillar 2, Secretary Austin and his counterparts will discuss plans to further enhance collaboration and harmonize acquisition processes over the next two years to accelerate the delivery of advanced capabilities to our defense forces. AUKUS presents a unique opportunity for our nations to collectively enhance our military capabilities, improve interoperability, and advance a shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. The department looks forward to continuing to work with our UK and Australian partners to implement this important work. Earlier this week, the Navy announced that USS Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group departed Naval Station Norfolk, Virginia for a regularly scheduled deployment to the US Naval Forces Europe and Europe, Africa, U.S. Sixth Fleet Area of Operations, demonstrating the commitment and power projection capability of the Navy's globally deployed force. The strike group will operate in the U.S. European Command Area of Responsibility in support of our maritime partners and NATO allies. Switching gears, the department continues to monitor Tropical Storm Helene as it is forecasted to intensify into a hurricane as it approaches the northeastern Gulf Coast on Thursday. Florida and Georgia have both declared states of emergency, and the governor of Florida has activated more than 3,300 National Guardsmen and 12 Rotary Wing aviation assets in state active duty status. These Guardsmen are pre-positioned around the state to provide responsive, sustained support, including high-wheeled vehicle rescues, aerial support, route clearance, and commodities distribution. Additionally, in the next 24 to 48 hours, the states of Georgia, Alabama, and North Carolina are expected to activate the National Guard as well. For more information, I would encourage you to reach out to National Guard Bureau of Public Affairs. And to close, last night the Senate confirmed more than 6,000 of our highly qualified military nominees in the Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and Space Force. These confirmations include Lieutenant General Nordhaus to be Chief of the National Guard Bureau, Vice Admiral Halsey to be Commander of U.S. Southern Command, Lieutenant General Reed to be Commander of U.S. Transportation Command, and Lieutenant General Brunson to be Commander of U.S. Forces Korea. We're very glad that the Senate has confirmed these officers for critical positions during this time and for our national security. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. All right. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, so later this week, we're possibly expecting an agreement on the withdrawal or transition of U.S. troops in Iraq. Um, what still needs to be done in that agreement? It seems from the Iraqi perspective that this decision has been made and the details are set. Uh, so thanks, Tara. I appreciate the question. I think as you alluded to, we'll, we'll probably have more details to share later this week. Um, what we've said from the beginning is that um, we know that the global coalition um, is and, and th that international coalition is going to transition into a bilateral security co uh, relationship with the Iraqis. Um, and this has been worked through um, the U.S.-Iraq Higher Military Commission working groups. So again, we'll, we should have more to share later this week, but at this time, I just, I don't want to get ahead of that process. So is it safe to assume that this means a reduction in the forces that are there from the 2,500? Mm -hmm. I think we'll have more to share this week. Secondly, um, the status of the refueler that's been damaged, yeah. and do you know anything else about what caused it to either run aground or run into something? Sorry, I was just trying to find some more for you on that. Um, the uh, the ship that you're referring to did um, uh, was damaged when it was, um, I believe, um, in the Fifth Fleet AOR. Um, currently under investigation to what exactly caused that damage, but that um, oil tanker refueler has been towed to a port and, um, you know, there was no leakage um, from the ship. But in terms of impacts to operations, no impacts there. But um, for more information, I'd have to refer you to the, to the Navy. 
And so you don't know what caused the damage? That's right. We're still, in, we're investigating the incident. Great. Okay, Idris, and welcome back. Um, Israel's military chief, um, I think earlier today, said that strikes in Lebanon would continue in order to not only destroy Hezbollah's infrastructure, but also prepare for a possible ground invasion. Just a general comment, and do you see a ground invasion as likely um, or even imminent? So in terms of um, a ground incursion or ground invasion, you know, that's really for the Israelis to speak to. Um, We certainly don't want to see any action taken that could lead to further escalation in the region. We still believe that there is time and and space for diplomacy. Um, We want to see a diplomatic resolution and a solution to prevent an all-out war. But in terms of, you know, the Israeli operations, I'd have to refer you to them to speak to that. And just to follow up, last week I think the Secretary had near daily calls with his Israeli counterpart. Mm -hmm. He hasn't spoken with them since the 22nd. Is there any reason for that? And should we expect any any conversations um, between the two of them in the coming days? I think you can expect them to continue to engage. Um, just because they haven't spoken every day doesn't mean that, you know, our teams haven't been in communication. Um, again, you know, he, he engages with Minister Galan on a pretty regular basis. And when we have more to share on when the next call happens, we'll certainly read it out. But, um, you know, just because he hasn't had one every single day this week doesn't mean that we're not engaging with the Israelis. Um, you've seen, uh, maybe not from this building, but other uh Agencies part of this administration engaging their Israeli counterparts, so we're continuing that that dialogue. Fadi, thank you, Sabrina. Um, is there any any um, support that the, the Pentagon is uh, uh, providing to the uh, Israeli military in uh, the current situation in Lebanon? In terms of any like ground support or air support, absolutely. Any support, even no. in terms of intelligence. No, no support. Not even intelligence sharing. No. So. Up until, I guess, unless there's some changes, you've been describing what's happening as defensive operations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe in the first day, (coughs) almost 500 civilians were killed, including women and children in Lebanon. Uh, Civilian infrastructure has been uh, damaged severely. Uh, Almost 1,300 airstrikes. Uh, Today, up until 3 p.m. Beirut time, more than 50,000 villages have been hit by Israelis. Uh, International organizations are describing what happened the first day as the highest death toll in Lebanon since the end of the civil uh, the civil war. So I'm just curious, what criteria are you using to describe what's happening as defensive operations? Well, Fadi, I think I'd have to point you back to October 8th when Lebanese Hezbollah attacked Israel following the um, you know, brutal attack that Hamas launched on October 7th. So these are still defensive operations. Um, you know, we understand the threat that Israel faces. Um, we are not supporting their operations when it comes to Lebanon. The support that you're seeing or what you're seeing when it comes to U.S. forces in the region is for our own force protection. And should we need to come to the defense of Israel like we saw um, from that you know, large scale attack from Iran, we've positioned forces to do that. But when it comes to Lebanon, the U.S. military has no involvement in Israel's operations. So just want to you know, lay that flat. Um, in terms of, you know, some of, some of what you just referenced, this is exactly why we're pushing for a diplomatic solution. We don't want to see innocent civilians, um, you know, lose their lives. We want to see a de-escalation happen. And, and you're seeing engagement from, you know, all parts of this administration, including at UNGA right now. Um, we're calling for a de-escalation, and we believe that a diplomatic off-ramp is the best way um, to resolve what's happening on that northern border. If a last question, sure. uh, did um, any official in the, in the Pentagon um, communicate any concerns about the high death toll among the Lebanese civilians? I mean, I know, and we know in, in Gaza that was a constant conversation. Has anyone raised that issue uh, in relation to Lebanon? Without getting into more details of the Secretary's calls with Minister Gallant, we are, of course, always concerned of civilian casualties. Um, We're seeing some of these strikes take place in areas where there are civilians. Um, You know, we're also seeing Israel notify populations to clear those areas. Um, Our focus, and and you're seeing a full court press here from uh, the United States government and this administration, we wanna see a diplomatic solution and we wanna see it you know, urgently. Um, and that's why you're seeing engagement, you know, whether it be at UNGA or, you know, in calls that the secretary is doing with Minister Gallant, um, and not just at his level, but, you know, at, at other levels as well. We want to see, um, we don't want to see any action taken on either side that would lead to further escalation. We want to see this de- de-escalate and the best off-ramp for that to prevent an all-out war is through diplomatic means. Thank you. Tom. 
Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah. Um, how confident are you that you can achieve a diplomatic off ramp, especially given the past um, nearly 12 months where the US has been unable to broker any kind of sustained uh, ceasefire in Gaza? So, for the situation with Hezbollah and Israel, how confident are you that we're not going to see a full scale conflict? Well, I'd, you know, push back on that respectfully. You know, we have seen periods where there has been a ceasefire put in place and we have seen, um, you know, the ability to get, we were talking, you know, months earlier about humanitarian aid uh, being able to get in. That was something that this administration brokered um, to make sure that we could get humanitarian aid and supplies in. So, look, you're, and, I, and not to reiterate just what I said to Fadi, but you're seeing a full court press from this administration at all levels for a diplomatic solution. Nothing is off the table. Um, we don't assess that either side wants a larger scale, wider regional conflict, um, but we're doing everything that we can to prevent that from happening. And that's why you're seeing the engagements that the president is doing from the secretary and then on down in the, in the building. And, uh, while I appreciate that you don't want to speak for Israel, <coughs> Um, are you able to share anything in terms of what you've seen o along the Lebanon-Israel border in terms of movement either side of it? Does it look like there's a ramp up towards some kind of a incursion? Right now it doesn't, you know, well, you know, without characterizing Israeli operations and letting them speak to them for themselves, you know, it doesn't look like anything is imminent. What we're seeing on that northern border is um, an increase in, you know, the tit for tat going back and forth strikes between Israel and Lebanese Hezbollah. And that is our concern. We, you know, we are concerned about a miscalculation. We don't want to see um, a wider regional conflict. And that's why in every conversation that we have, in the conversations that are happening in New York, we're, we are continuing to press for a diplomatic resolve. Just yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we all know that Secretary Austin is uh, always in contact with uh, his Israeli counterpart. Uh, does the secretary have any objections to the way Israel is conducting its operations inside Lebanon? In terms of? In terms of, uh, as you may know, targeting civilians, maybe carpet bombing to the villages along the border. Uh, well, I mean, something that we've raised is we don't want to see this escalate. And any time that um, there is a um, actions taken that could further escalate the war, that's not, uh, or like a, a broader conflict that we want to avoid a regional war. Um, the secretary, in all of his conversations, urges um, restraint and urges you know the Israelis to consider civilian casualties, and that's something that we've said from the very beginning. Um, Look, I'm not going to get into more details on their private conversations, but of course it's something that the secretary discusses with his counterpart and will continue to raise. I mean, uh, could you confirm if the secretary uh, told Gallant that they need to avoid the infrastructure in Lebanon? I think what I can tell you is what I was what I reiterated earlier is that, of course, we are always concerned where there are strikes in areas where there are as I, is a concentrated civilian population. That's something that the secretary raises on his calls with uh, Minister Gallant. It's something that, you know, at different levels in this building, we also raise with our Israeli counterparts, but I'm just not going to be able to go beyond that. Liz. Thanks, Sabrina. On China's ICBM test launch, um, a U.S. defense official said earlier today that China gave the U.S. warning it was going to do this launch. Was that through military channels or diplomatic channels? Um, I don't have more specifics to provide on the channels, but we were given some advance notice, but I'm just not going to get into more specifics of that. I will say that that is a good thing, and that is moving in the right direction in terms of, uh, you know, getting that advanced notification, and um, that further reduces the risks of any misperception and miscalculation, so we certainly welcome that. Were any U.S. citizens, like, at harm by this test in any way during it or following it? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. All right. Just a, a quick question. Israeli officials have, have said their strategy with Lebanon is escalate to de-escalate. Does the Pentagon think that's a viable strategy for how to conduct operations with Lebanon? So I'm not going to, you know, characterize uh, the Israelis' operations. What I can tell you is only, you know, our view and our perception is that um, any type of escalation um, that, that could lead to a miscalculation 
um, we don't want to see. Uh, we want to see steps that lead to de-escalation and, and frankly, steps that lead to a diplomatic off-ramp, which we believe is the best solution here. That's what we're pushing for. That's what you're seeing happen at UNGA. Um, that's also what you're seeing the secretary, uh, you know, continue to emphasize in his calls with Minister Gallant. And when he has the next call, you know, that will be something that, you know, I'm sure he would reiterate as well. Okay. Hey, hey. Uh -huh. Sure. In response to Tom's question, you said it doesn't look like anything is imminent. Was that in reference to a Le uh, Israeli incursion into Lebanon? I believe the, the context was in terms of a ground incursion. So I was saying in that context, it doesn't look like something is imminent. But again, I'd refer you to the Israelis to speak to their own operations. Rio. Thank you. Yeah. I have a follow-up question on Chinese ICBM of launch. Course. Um, so what's your assessment of this unusual ICBM launch into the uh, Pacific Ocean? And do you think this is a provocative action? And, and especially do you think they want to send a message to the US? In terms of, you know, the the whys, I'd refer you to the PRC to speak to that. Um, you know, we monitored the ICBM test. Uh, to Liz's question, you know, again, we did receive some advance notification of this ICBM test, and we believe that that was a good thing. That was a step in the right direction, and it does lead, uh, you know, to preventing any um, misperception or miscalculation. Um, what we can do here from the department is continue to press for a more regular regularized bilateral notification arrangement when it comes to ballistic missile and space launches. And um, this is something that we've proposed with the PRC, and it represents you know, a common sense confidence building measure. So we want to see these types of notifications continue. Yes. A question about presidential drawdown authority with regard sure. to Ukraine. Could you tell us what the department's plan is to keep using that after September 30th? We've seen reports that there's like a workaround that the department can notify Congress and then that is legal. Uh, could you tell us what that workaround is, but also could you tell us why that workaround is needed? You've got some criticism today from Senator Wicker saying that the department should have spent this money already or used this authority, I should say, since April. Sure. Um, so on your, on your first question on how we're going to use the authority, I don't have anything to announce right now, but what I can tell you is that we're committed to making sure Ukraine gets the resources Congress approved by the end of the president's term. Again, I don't have more to announce right now, but we're committed to making sure that Ukraine gets what it, what it has been allotted by Congress. And we are working with the interagency to do just that. Um, so, you know, bear with us and we'll, we'll have more to share soon. Um, in terms of your follow on question on the, the criticism. Look, I'd have to point you back to the fact that for six months, we didn't have a supplemental. So we weren't able to refill our own shelves. So therefore, when you're not able to backfill and refill our own stocks, we're not able to send out PDAs. So you have to remember during that time, we still had some existing authority, but we weren't able to send equipment, capabilities, systems out to Ukraine because we didn't have it on our stocks. During that time, during that six months lag, because we weren't able to do that, that also impacts packages going down the road. So we're going to find we're, we're going to make sure Ukraine gets what it needs, you know, in the future. But to, to, to push back on that criticism, I would say that when you don't have what you need on your shelves, it makes it hard to send out that equipment, you know, in, in the timetable that Congress gave us uh, when, it, when it was authorized. So is the plan now to move at a more at a faster rate than you've been moving so you can get it done before President Biden ends his term? I think we'll have more to share in the coming days. I just don't have more for you right now. Noah. Uh, just ask a follow-up on sure. that. Because of the issues in getting the supplemental approved and certainly the issues in replenishing stocks because of that, all of that was known when the supplemental was passed in April. Is there a reason that the funding or the authority wasn't extended beyond the fiscal year? Well, I think also, no, you have to remember that we're, we're talking about um, – also working with the defense industrial base that has to backfill our own shelves. So there, you know, there's a lot of coordination and timing here. We did ask Congress for that authority to extend, um, and you know that did not happen. So now we are in a different place. Um, so I can't, you know, go back and 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 answer questions of like what if this happened and and when. All I can tell you is that we're committed to making sure Ukraine has what it needs, and we're going to do it. Um, and that's a commitment that this president has made. Um, and when we have more to share, we will. Jared. Sabrina, how comfortable is the department with, uh, the, the, with the department's understanding on what the Israeli military's intentions and the near midterm plans are in Lebanon operationally? Um, has, have the Israelis briefed you on what they intend to do? 
So I'm not going to go into more details um, of the conversations between the secretary and Minister Gallant, but it's something that the that you know has been discussed, and it's something that the secretary continues um, to you know in, in all of his conversations. I think you've seen the readouts. It's something that he asks about and that they discuss. But I'm just not going to go beyond the readout. Yeah, in the back. Um, it's being reported that 60 additional U.S. troops are being deployed to Cyprus to help with potential mass evacuations of U.S. citizens from, from Lebanon. Can you confirm that? I cannot confirm the number, but what I can tell you is that we are sending a small number of additional U.S. military personnel forward to augment forces that are already in the region. Um, I'm just not going to be able to provide you more specifics. I know I've seen the reporting. I know it's frustrating, but I'm just not going to be able to confirm more. And just to follow up with the story from last week, is it the Pentagon's view that it is an acceptable, it's acceptable under the laws of war to booby trap civilian objects uh, and place them among civilian populations? Is that is that acceptable for any nation to do? That's something that, um, well, one, without commenting on an operation that the U.S. military had no involvement in, it's hard for me to get into the hypotheticals. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to try and go down and explain, you know, legalese from here. Um, so I, I just can't comment further on that operation. In yeah. The U.S., though, affecting supply chains or inter in intercepting supply chains in order to place explosive items within normal consumer objects, right? Yeah, now. I'm not going to comment on a hypothetical or, or, or an operation that we had no part of. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, um, Secretary Austin uh, on Sunday told his uh, Israeli counterpart to give time for uh, diplomacy to work. And on Monday, we saw that Israel started to bomb Lebanon. And um, today, um, the Israel Defense Force has announced that they call up and the deployment of two reserve brigades to the border with Lebanon. So where is the time that, that uh, Secretary Austin asked Israel for the diplomacy? And do you still believe that Israel uh, listening to you. Thank you. We do believe that we have, um, that Israel's listening. I mean, just the fact that they're listening by the amount of calls that the secretary has had with Minister Gallant, I think that shows their willingness to hear our, our um, views, our concerns, and our, um, you know, to, to hear from the secretary. So I think that's important to note. Um, in terms of, you know, I, I think your question was getting to, um, it, are we writing off, you know, diplomatic measures? And and we're not. Um, diplomacy is still the best path forward. There's always a way for diplomacy. There's always a way for both sides to, you know, to come to the table and 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 to have this resolved in diplomatic measures. Um, from the very beginning, I mean, since October seventh, and and then you know October eighth, when we've moved additional assets to the region. The whole focus of this administration has been to not only de-escalate, but you know, to to, to send a message of deterrence. Um, I think we have been successful in that. Um, you know, this it, we know tensions are high, but we also don't. We also see that there is a path forward for diplomacy, and that's why you're seeing this administration push so hard to get this done. Um, and you're going to continue to. We're not going to give up on that. Um, so we're going to continue to engage. Um, sure. uh, I have a this. Uh, there is mm -hmm. some uh, media reports ask, uh, out or saying that the U.S. is now working with uh, with the France about a ceasefire, uh, maybe a deal or a plan for Lebanon. Um, um, does anyone from the DOD have involved uh, or involved in this uh, negotiation that right, that's happening right now in the United Nations during the UN summit in uh, New York? I don't have anything on, on those reports. I mean, I've been pretty public in telling you that we're pushing for, you know, diplomatic measures to resolve uh, what's happening on that northern border. But I, I just don't have more to add on, on that report. And I'm sorry, I haven't seen it. Louis. Yeah, hi, Sabrina. Um, is the shipment of 2,000 pound bombs for Israel, is that still on hold? Still paused. So the rationale behind that, from what I understand, was when Israel was preparing to go into Rafah, you know, to protect uh, civilian lives, limited operations. Are there any concerns given um, the current ongoing air operations that Israel has been conducting, striking in civilian neighborhoods? And, you know, I know that we're seeing secondary effects, so it appears that there are, they are striking the targets they're hitting. But are there concerns that um, they, the use of these bombs, again, uh, presumably American bombs, uh, could be um, putting civilians at risk? So, um, 
you first asked about the 2,000 pound bomb shipment. So that is still paused. So I don't, you know, I don't know what they're using in their operation. So I refer you to them to speak to that. Um, there is always a concern about civilian casualties. And that is something that the secretary has addressed, you know, really from the beginning, whether it be in Gaza or elsewhere. Um, that's a conversation that we continue to have. I think, you know, in that same vein, we're also concerned about escalation. Um, and that's why we don't want to see any action taken by, you know, either side that could lead to further escalation. And that's what the secretary continues to emphasize, along with always talking about the need to prote protect civilians. Um, and you are seeing, I, I mean, you know, I'm citing public public sourcing here, but, you know, the Israelis notifying communities and um, towns on that northern border to to clear that area because they will be conducting operations. Um, you know, we have to protect civilians in the battle space. That's something the secretary has said. I know you've heard him say that before as well. Um, our focus, of course, is that. But <laughs> the best way to protect civilians is, of course, through a diplomatic means and for this to be resolved um, through diplomacy. And that's why we continue to push for that. Um, is the secretary um, in the future planning to meet or travel to Israel in the future? Yeah, you know, I'm not, I don't have any announcements to make in terms of travel, um, but when we do, I'm, I'm, you'll be the first to know. Yes, in the back. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, you emphasized that the administration- I just, I'm sorry, I just committed to giving Louis an exclusive on the secretary's travel. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. And, you know, we'll, we'll discuss, we'll discuss later. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you emphasize that the administration's position is that you don't want to see further escalation and you don't want to see an all-out war. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line, um, you know, especially with regards to a possible uh, ground operation that may be imminent? Well, like I said, I, I mean, I don't know that it is imminent. Um, and what we continue to push for, and I, I'm not trying to use a tired talking point here, it's actually just, you know, the fact is that we do continue to push for a diplomatic resolution here. Um, from the secretary to you know the inner agency, that's something that we continue to engage on, um, and you know in terms of the the conflict itself, we still believe like right now the conflict has been contained to Gaza. There's no question that there are higher tensions in the region. There's no question that there's been an increase um, in border clashes in that northern border, but. We believe that in order to avert an all-out regional war, it's through diplomatic means. And so we're going to continue to push for that. And you're seeing that happen in New York, and you're seeing that happen here as well. Last one. Just a quick follow, though. How has the conflict been contained to Gaza? You have civilians being killed in Lebanon. Sure. But what I would tell you is that it's not how we would characterize, you know, an all-out full-scale regional war. What you're seeing is a trade of um, fires back and forth on that northern border. I'd point you to October 8th when Hezbollah started launching those. Um, we're not seeing this widen out to a regional conflict. And that's what we are concerned about. And that's why, you know, the secretary from the beginning, whether it be the Ford, the Ike, uh, you know, the, the, the 26 Mu that was in the region, um, and now you have uh, the Lincoln there, um, you know, we continue to position assets in the region to send a message of deterrence um, because we don't want it to scale up. Yes, we acknowledge that, you know, there have been, you know, innocent people that have been killed and we don't want to see that happen. And that's why we continue to press for diplomatic means. Can you take one more? Please? Sure, so, one more. And then yeah. I've got one in the back and so then we'll. This is, uh, I know this is a, a planning organization. That's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> that's the answer I, 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 yeah. uh, in, in regards to Lebanon, uh, did the Pentagon put together uh, uh, any NEO plans in case uh, there's the need for it? You're so going to hate my answer. Yes, but we are a planning organization. We plan for a wide range of contingencies. I will point you back, though, to, you know, early on last year, or sorry, late last year, but early on after October 7th, when I think I was up here, General Ryder was up here getting a lot of questions about a NEO. I will say we are always a planning organization prepared for any contingency, and we never had to use those plans. We will always have plans on the shelves that we can dust off at any time. And that is the amazing thing of our military is we are able to surge capabilities to the region. Um, and the secretary did just that. And we have you know, incredible firepower in the region right now. Um, so again, I'm not going to get ahead of anything. That's also a State Department decision to make. But Fadi, to answer your own question, we are a planning organization. 
All right, Mike, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, you, uh, Pentagon always talk, or often talks about deterrence and giving Israel enough to defend themselves. Does this administration, would they like Israel to actually win their battle, win their war against Hamas, win their war against Hezbollah? Is, is, do you have a position on that one way or the other? Well, I think we've said time and again that we support Israel's right to self-defense. Uh, you know, what a, what a win looks like is really for Israel to define, um, but we are supporting them and their right to self-defense. And of course, you know, we understand and, you know, know the threats that they're facing from these terrorist organizations, and that's why we are supporting them in their fight against, you know, what, you know, the threats that they face on their borders. Um, but beyond that, I just don't have more to add. Okay. Thanks, everyone.